In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Luke 24, verse 52. The writer Luke has given us God's people not just one, but two books of the Bible, Luke and Acts. What's more, the, back, the books tie the time of Jesus' life on earth together with his apostles' work after he left this earth. The point about which these two books turn is Christ's ascension. This event in church history doesn't stand out like Jesus' birth or his resurrection or even Pentecost for that matter, but the last part of Luke's gospel in the beginning of Acts gives, provides us with Christ's final directions to his disciples as well as words of promise. Luke tells us at the end of his gospel that Jesus opened the minds of his fo uh, followers to understand the scriptures and what they said about him in regard to his death and to his resurrection. After this, he tells them that to wait in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father comes to them. Jesus elaborates in Acts that this gift is the Holy Spirit, sometimes known as the helper, or if you are a dabbler in Greek, the paraclete. Luke also tells us that Jesus blessed them just prior to and also during his ascension. Jesus, in essence, was equipping his disciples for their mission. Before this time, as we read in the uh, Gospels, the disciples followed their master throughout his travels, and, he learned, and they learned from them. And he now gives them clarity on why he had to suffer and die, as well as his resurrection. These men who, see, we, who we see through the Gospels as many times being bumbling, selfish, and a lot of times just plain clueless, were being prepared to proclaim the message of salvation in Christ. It was a time of preparation. Jesus goes on to tell his disciples that they would be his witnesses. The epistle reading in Acts tells us they would be Christ's witnesses in this order, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the end of the earth. The disciples were chosen not only to simply see the events and to absorb knowledge from their teacher, but were called to communicate these truths to the world. In fact, apostles mean sent ones. So as you read in Acts, you can see Christ's direction unfolding from the point of Acts 1-8, where he gives that first instruction, to the very end where we see Paul in Rome. So Christ's ascension then was not just a time of preparation, but also a time of direction, or as it says in Matthew 28, a time of commissioning. We also notice two events that don't seem to be obviously connected in these two passages. From Luke, it says the disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy. On its own, this seems a rather strange response for a group of people who just saw their teacher uh, and Lord leave them. Acts, however, records for us that two men in white robes stood by these men and they said that Jesus would return in the same way as they saw him go up into heaven. Jesus' ascension then wasn't a final goodbye but rather a see you later in the future. The men didn't say when Christ would come back but the disciples must have understood that he would keep his promise just as he did when he was resurrected. They must have also understood that the promised spirit wouldn't come until Christ ascended, as it says in John 16. It was this spirit who would not only empower, but guide them into all truth, because he speaks what he receives from Christ. The, name, the time of Christ's ascension is a time of anticipation of not only the promise of the spirit, but also the eventual return of Christ. Today, Christians of all stripes have benefited from the preparation and commissioning of the disciples. People from all walks of life have heard and responded to the gospel of salvation that has been proclaimed for over 2,000 years. The mustard seed has grown larger and larger and continues to do so, despite the attempts of the world to stunt its growth. It has gone out not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction as Paul, Paul states in his letter to the Thessalonians. 
We know Christ is with us, just as he promised his disciples in the Great Commission, and Paul assures us of in Romans 8. We, then, like the disciples, await Christ's return. It is our anticipation. It is our hope. While the church debates the when and how of this event, we nonetheless affirm this hope in our creeds, as we just said in the Nicene Creed, and in our lives as well. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that both the dead in Christ and those still alive in him will meet him in the clouds as he descends in final victory. In the meantime, we are called to live in the joy of our salvation as God works in us to conform us to the image of his Son, as it says in Romans 8, 29, being ready to give a reason for the hope that we have within us, as Peter tells us in his first letter, chapter 3, verses 15 through 16. So what we take from these verses is that the Christian faith is not one of resignation. We understand the world and those living in it are fallen, but that God will make all things new. Death isn't the final answer, contrary to most modern opinion, and neither is the brokenness we experience today. God keeps his promises, and he has promised that Christ will return for us to be with him not just for a visit, but forever. And this is our hope as Christians, our anchor, and the good news we are called to share with the world. Amen.